We've been considering in the last couple of videos the case where we have a functional involving two independent variables, so a two-dimensional problem. We've done some examples, and I want to do an, another example, but I actually want to do it backwards. So this is the inverse variational problem. It's known as the Dirichlet problem. So the Dirichlet problem is solving Laplace's equation subject to Dirichlet boundary conditions, known values of the function u on the boundary. But we're going to do it backwards, and the idea here is that as we've been doing so far, we start with the variational form, that's step one, and then step two, we get the Euler equation, which you can think of as the differential form for that variational form. Now we're gonna go backwards. We're gonna look at a case where we know the governing differential equation, in this case, Laplace's equation. We wanna go backwards to get the corresponding variational form. This is commonly done in finite element methods where you go from the so-called strong form, the differential form, to the weak form, is the variational form. So again, this is known as the inverse problem because we're essentially going backwards. So we have the Dirichlet problem. Once again, that's Laplace's equation here given in two-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. And let's say that we have fixed boundary conditions all the way around the boundary. And that's what makes it the Dirichlet problem. Laplace equation plus fixed boundary conditions. So how do we turn this, the differential form or the strong form, into its equivalent variational or weak form? So we do two things. The first is we're gonna multiply our differential equation by the variation of the dependent variable. So in this case, that's delta u. So you just take LU, the differential equation, where L is the differential operator, and multiply delta u times that. So you see that here. Then the second step is to integrate over the entire domain, A, which is bounded by C. So we started out with LU is equal to zero we multiply by the variation, and then we integrate over the domain. So we end up with this area integral, because it's a two-dimensional problem, over dA of our differential equation, L operating on U, times the variation of U, the dependent variable, set equal to zero. In our case, we have Laplace's equation. So this is the area integral of partial squared U, partial X squared, plus partial squared U, partial Y squared, all times delta u, and that's equal to zero. So let's just imagine that we have a rectangular domain from x0 to x1 and y0 to y1. So we have a rectangular domain in which we have Laplace's equation being the governing equation, and when we get and we want to get the variational and we want to get the equivalent variational form of Laplace's equation. In the end, this is going to help us with one of the themes that I mentioned way back at the beginning of chapter one. And that is that the variational form often gives us additional insight and intuition into the physics. And I wanna show you how that's the case here. Okay, so let's take the uxx term. So partial squared u partial x squared term. And that's integrated with respect to x and y. You'll notice I've put the x derivative inside and the y derivative outside because it's derivatives with respect to x. So we're gonna do integration by parts in the x direction. So I want to now move derivatives off of the u x x and onto the delta u. Just think of that derivation that we did for the Euler equation, but now backwards. So in that case, we wanted to get derivatives off of the delta u. Now we actually want to get derivatives back onto the delta u. So this u x x delta u term, I want to look like u sub x times delta u sub x. Because if I do that, that I can take advantage of the fact that something times the variation of that same something is just one half times the variation of the something squared. This is exactly the reverse of what we have done so many times in the previous cases, where we had the variation of something squared is two times the something times the variation of something. So we're just now gonna use that backwards. So in a sense, I wanna equilibrate the derivatives on the u and on the delta u. So to do that, we'll do integration by parts again, but now for the opposite reason. So I'll have my term evaluated at the endpoints, but because u is known and specified on the boundary, delta u is zero and that term goes away. Then I have minus u sub x delta u sub x. And so you can see I've done what I wanted. I've moved one derivative off of the, u, off of the uxx onto the delta u. So now I have something times the variation of something. Now I've just repeated it here without this first term. So when I have something times the variation of something, that's one half times the variation of the something squared. Again, just using this general result down here. 
All right, so that's for the UXX term. For the UYY term, you do exactly the same thing, but then it's integration by parts in the Y direction. And notice what we've done. We've gotten the variation out of the rest of the integrand. So that's the variation of I set equal to zero. Now we can extract out the I. So you can see here now delta I is zero. It's the variation of the integral of capital F. And now I know what capital F is. So in the case of the Dirichlet problem, we have the u sub x squared term, which is what we got right here, u sub x squared. And then from the y derivative term, we have a u sub y squared term as well. So we have the variation of the integral of the square of these partial derivatives of u with respect to x and u with respect to y. Now you can also write this in vector notation as del u dot del u if you'd like. So let's just take a look at this form right here. Here's my functional. And I just want us to think about what does this tell us about the processes, the physical processes that are governed by Laplace's equation. The contention I would make is the only reason why we know that Laplace's equation governs diffusive processes is because we've been told that over and over again. If you look at Laplace's equation by itself in differential form, that does not scream diffusion. It doesn't tell you mathematically what diffusion represents and what diffusion does. However, if you look at this form, my contention is that is much more intuitive and much more clear in terms of what is mathematically happening in diffusive processes. So we'll get to that in a moment. But what you can see it right away is that the Dirichlet problem, Laplace's equation with fixed boundary conditions, corresponds to minimizing the sum of the magnitudes of the gradients of u, x, y. So let's just walk ourselves through that. Partial u, partial x, that's the gradient of u in the x direction. Partial u, partial y, that's the gradient of u, the slope of u in the y direction. You sum the squares, so squaring them means that the sign doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter whether it's large and positive or small or large and negative, you're just minimizing the magnitudes of those gradients and summing them up. And you're doing that throughout the entire region A. So again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, what that represents physically. So as I've said, Laplace's equation governs diffusive processes that occur in heat conduction and all over the place. But let's use heat conduction as, a, as an example of this. Now for those of you who are familiar with finite element methods, you might have recognized some of the terminology that I just used as well as some of the operations that I use and see some similarities with what we do in finite element methods. So as I mentioned, we have the strong and the weak form. The strong form is the differential form and the weak form is the integral or variational form. And so if you remember, when you go from the strong form to the weak form, you multiply by your weight functions, which are here, the delta u's. You integrate over the domain and you do integration by parts to get the weak form. It's exactly what we just did, but we did it in the more general variational methods context. So you, again, you'll see a lot of similarities there. If you look at chapter three of the book, you'll see a, a brief introduction to finite element methods put into context of Glurkin, rayleigh ritz methods, and so forth. And you'll see it presented from this variational point of view, and you'll see clearly how they relate to one another. There's also in chapter three in section 3.1, there's another example of converting a differential equation into its equivalent variational forms. So we should be comfortable doing this, whether it's because we want to use finite element methods or we want to see if we can interpret and gain a better intuition of what the physics of a particular problem is representing. Now this inverse problem can be done. In other words, you can go from the strong or the differential form all the way back to the weak variational form if your equation is linear and self-adjoint. So in the ODE case, that means it has to be of a sturm louisville form. And if it's a partial differential equation, it has to be a self-adjoint. If that's the case, then you know for a fact you can prove that the variational form or the weak form does exist. If that's not the case, you can't prove it. So this actually led to the delay of using finite element methods in a number of different physical areas, such as my area, fluid mechanics, which is highly nonlinear. So for many years, people thought you couldn't use finite element methods in the context of nonlinear fluid mechanics. That's actually not the case, and, and that has been dealt with a number of years ago, uh, but it did lead to some confusion early on. So let's come back to this physical interpretation. Think about what this variational form is telling us about these diffusive processes. So remember what we said. 
we're minimizing the magnitudes of the derivatives of the gradients, the slopes, around the entire domain. So, so we can't make them all zero because you have to have some temperature distribution given the boundary conditions and so forth. But what you want, according to Laplace's equation and the variational form more specifically, is for it to be as smooth as possible, such that the gradients and the slopes are as small as possible in an integrated fashion throughout the entire domain. So it's a smoothing process. It's going to take whatever sharp changes and large gradients in the temperature and smooth them out as much as possible, again, given the domain, given the boundary conditions, and, and so forth. So that's what I mean by the variational form giving us additional insight and intuition into the physical processes that these equations represent. Now if you generalize this a bit, you can get the Poisson equation. So if you add a term in the functional 2 times f times u, where f is some known function of x and y, then when you get the Euler equation, it actually results in what's known as the Poisson equation. The Poisson equation is just a non-homogeneous form of the Laplace equation, as you see here with the f on the right-hand side.